Hi, welcome to Ask the Manager. It's the day after the election. We have a lot to talk about. First of all, Proposition Two and a Half override passed substan by substantial numbers. Um, Jim Kane is our new moderator, and Teresa Flynn is our new selectman, and John Wensky got reelected to the school committee. And a lot of the other results are still coming in, as far as I know. Um, and I did get town meeting member. I, I just found that out. <laughs> uh, so anyways, um, tell me what you believe would have happened to town hall, for example, and town employees had this override not passed. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Donna. First, congratulations on your town meeting <laughs> uh, re-election there. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think for morale, not I think, I know for morale, um, we could already see it in the run up to the election. Folks were really concerned. Um, we were going to have to make significant cuts and it would not have, um, we've not, we would not have been able to do it without impacting each and every department in the town, <clears throat> including town hall and town administration. Um, we were facing a, a very substantial, as, as we reported, um, and, and tried to share and with with everyone in town substantial um, <clears throat> deficit, and it would have it would have come to fruition starting today, where we'd have had to to find at least two million dollars on the municipal side, uh, leaving about two point eight million dollars of cuts on the school side. So I think in total we'd have been looking we'd have been pushing a hundred total layoffs between town and school. Um, in order to make that happen. So, um, yeah, quite the opposite this morning. Uh, folks are happy and, and relief. And, and the most common comment that I've heard from folks so far is that we're so excited to get to do what we're planning to do. So, um, you know, everyone's really focused to kind of live up to the obligation that uh, came through with a yes vote yesterday. Is there a simple way to explain how this happened, how we came to this deficit? The simplest way I can explain it is, is proposition two and a half. I mean, uh, honestly, um, you know, if, if we're limited in the amount of new revenue that we're allowed to raise um, and expenses across the board um, over the past, you know, five years and, and further back than that have been increasing by more than two and a half percent on an annual basis in order to provide services that, that residents expect. Um, you know, certainly there are, um, you know, costs associated with our personnel or our local government. The vast majority of our costs are in our personnel who provide those services. Those haven't increased by more than two and a half percent on average. But they've been around, you know, two percent or or so, and and that's a substantial part part of our our budget. And it's not that you know people are getting you know crazy raises. It's it's just keeping up with the cost of living and and honestly trying to stay competitive as an employer. So, you know, residents always look to us to you know provide services, whether it's educational services, um, you know, public health services senior center services library and to do it very professionally efficiently and in order to do that we have to have a you know a, a dedicated group of staff and and that are willing to work that are engaged in the workplace and aren't looking for another job because they're so underpaid they can't even afford their own bills so that's part of the external competitiveness that you know uh, comes in you know dealing uh, you know being a local government in, in central Massachusetts with a high higher cost of living you know we we have to be competitive and then you know our expenses um, you know our contracted out expenses are still a lot cheaper uh, in the long run than having employees doing it but we saw it with the um, the trash hauling uh, contract. You know, we had been benefiting under the prior hauler of the contract only going up 2% a year. But then, you know, when we went back out to the marketplace, we saw a 5% increase. And this contractor is building, you know, greater increases year over year. 
The school bus contract is pretty much the same thing. You know, we're facing significant cost increases. So even those things that we're contracting out, on average, are increasing faster than the new revenue that we're allowed to raise. We have that cap on our revenue, but there's no cap on those expenses it's what the marketplace will yield through you know very highly competitive uh, process that we have to follow under state law so really simply it's expenditures and uh, costs are outpacing the revenues it's not from mismanagement it's not from overspending it's not from people not keeping their eye on uh, the finances am i but, correct well, that, no, that's 100% correct. And, and I mean, I think we have so many examples that we can point to where we do everything that we can can possibly do to save taxpayer dollars. Um, you know, we, we take part in regional shared services agreements, which, you know, you know, are three big ones for veteran services, um, you know, public health, animal control. Um, those save us, you know, probably over the course of a year, nearly $100,000, uh, year after year after year. Um, you know, public health probably saves us, you know, 50 or 60,000, uh, you know, alone, just, just by itself. Um, you know, we do things like we refinance the, you know, the Sherwood bonds, uh, you know, in April and received an incredible interest rate that will save us over $2 million over the, the final 10 years in the repayment of that. Um, you know, personally, it's, it's, it's my passion and desire to, um, run this government as efficiently as possible. No one wants to have the highest tax rate. You know, no one wants to have a high tax bill. We want residents to really feel good about the town that they live in and, and find value in their taxpayer dollars. Um, you know, and we take no satisfaction and happen to ask an override question. It's not because it was the easiest thing to do. It's something that we felt we had to do um, and, and allow residents to make that decision and then live with it today, right? That's what we're forced to do. We, we took a risk. We don't take a lot of risk in local government, but asking that question was a risk. You made a comment at a recent meeting about our tax rate being on the average in the middle related to cities and towns around the state. Um, and you gave a good explanation. I'd like you to repeat that if you know what yeah, I'm so, Yeah, so the, it's our, our tax bill. So what taxpayers actually pay is really right in the, right in the midpoints or, or it's, it's, it's the average, sorry, not the midpoints, the average. Um, and, you know, I think that's a very good place to be. Um, but, you know, the comment that I made that I think you're referring to is, is that I don't think anyone thinks, you know, any resident, I know certainly not, you know, other local government colleagues or people that we interview for positions, they never say, well, I'm interested in, in moving to Shrewsbury or working for Shrewsbury or partnering with Shrewsbury because you're a really average town. <laughs> like no one says that. Everyone Everyone rightfully so, and it's a responsibility that we all hold as staff members and, and think about every day is everyone thinks we're a very high performing town, a, a wonderful town to live in, a, a world class, you know, uh, services and, and wonderful education. Um, no one thinks of us as average. So um, we want to maintain our, our tax bills as low as possible. There's no doubt about that, but there's there, there's an inherent inability to continue to provide quality services if we don't have sufficient funding. So we, we can't expect to have the lowest tax bill in, in the best local government uh, that we can possibly be. Those two things are inherent opposites. And we do seem to have a high level of services, which we expect um, compared to a lot of towns, even though we're in the middle as far as our tax rate goes. Right. And yeah. I think that that's an important thing for us to keep in mind as you look from town to town. Yeah. And, and one of the other things that I don't think I talk about enough is our success in grants. You know, we always talk about how we manage costs, um, you know, what we do to reduce costs, you know, regularly bidding out services and, um, 
you know, things like that and always to try, always managing our costs. But we do a really good job in receiving grant funding. You know, we have like a, you know, skilled tax or skilled tax, skilled grant writers in almost every department. Um, certainly, I have to tip my hat to the fire department. I think they're the, the leading entity that gets grants for their own department. Um, you know, firefighter Mike Borowick is a, is a wonderful grant writer and has, you know, brought in hundreds of, well, you know, probably, yeah, probably pushing a million dollars for, for the town in everything that he's written. But, you know, it goes the same across all departments. Um, you know, whether the grant is a, quote, competitive grant or a formula grant, you still have to apply. You still have to justify your expenditures to the state. Um, and a lot of municipalities don't even have the capability to do that. And we've been so successful. You know, each and every year we're, you know, on average for the last three or four years, we've been receiving, you know, Three hundred to six hundred thousand dollars in grants, which is meaningful savings because it, it means we we don't need to rely upon the the tax rate and the tax bill to cover uh, those type of expenses. Uh, how was the voter turnout? Do you know? Well, so um, I I want to say um, I can look at the numbers. There's about seven thousand total votes that were cast. Um, that's only about 30%, I believe, of the total registered voters, maybe a little bit shy of that. Um, so I, I think it was still low, and we'd always like to see 100% uh, uh, voter turnout, of course. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, 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 was, it was pretty good for a, a local election. So. so you think it was around 30%? Yes. That's actually high for a town election. Um, yeah. I, I recall elections being at 11 percent. Yeah. And so I imagine that uh, Proposition two and a half brought out more voters this time. Um, so I always think that high voter participation gives us a better feel for what people in town are thinking and what they have for values. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So, I mean, there were 7,092 votes cast on the override. That's that's what I have in front of me. Um, they were I, I don't know the exact number of, of registered voters, but somewhere between 21 and 25,000. Um, so yeah, it's we a, always it's a, we always want more, but 30 percent isn't bad. It's it's yeah, it's really good for a, a, a municipal election. Yes. Now, is it true that had we not open continued with opening Beale, the new Beale school um, on schedule that the state could take that money back? The 40, it, is it 42 um, percent? Yeah, it was about yeah, it was, it's about um, 33 million dollars. Uh, it was a reality. I have a, a, well, first and foremost, we reached out to the MSBA, the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Um, in late February and said to them, look, we're seeing a financial challenge in Shrewsbury and here's what it is. You know, we explained the structural deficit um, and, and we reminded the MSBA and it's something that we tried to illustrate to voters is that the Beale School, unlike some of the other schools that are being built in the Commonwealth, yes, the existing Beale School is old and it needs replaced because it's a deteriorating or, you know, less than desirable building to educate students in, but it, that's not the sole reason. The, you know, the, the primary driver behind the new Beale Elementary School is to relieve overcrowding at the K through four level for the entire district. So in order to do that, it's more than just taking the educators that are in the current Beale School and moving them into the new building. It's a redistricting plan, it's adding staff, it's reducing class sizes. So um, we reached out to MSBA and, and explained all this to them. And they sent me a letter back after the phone call and said, look, you have a, you have a project funding agreement that, that the town of Shrewsbury has signed off on. And if you fail to live up to the uh, requirements of that PFA, they call it, uh, you'll have to return the funding. Um, so thankfully, we, we never had to sit down across the table with lawyers and 
um, other interested parties and, and find out the, the finite details of when and how much and what those expectations were, but they're very clear in the letter. If you don't move forward, you owe the grant back to us. So And we already uh, received part of that money also. Oh, so we've already oh, yeah. spent it. Yep. So on a monthly basis, we submit uh, for reimbursement to the state and, you know, they provide the, you know, their share of the project back to us. Uh, so we have been, we've received um, probably almost $20 million in that, uh, from that $33 million grant thus far. Okay. I'm going to jump around because I have so many questions. Um, don't you hate robocalls? And you hear that recording and that voice, and doesn't your skin just crawl like you just want to hang up? Well, no. <laughs> okay, everybody knows what I'm talking about. Um, the town, when we get the code red calls from the town, it now sounds like an obnoxious robocall. And I have found myself hanging up before I realize it's the town calling. Is there a way to identify that it's the town of Shrewsbury before? I hang up quickly. Yeah, so we try to do that. We probably don't do it every time. The The introductory line that we always try to use is, you know, this is an important message from, and then we name the department. Um, so the, the We're getting the obnoxious voice, lady. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so the robocall voice, I admit, is annoying. We, we try to do that for, for clarity purposes uh, for a couple things. So we have the option to record a voice. So, um, but when we do that, you have to get it right. And you have to redo it if you don't get it right, because you don't want to say something wrong. You don't want to be unclear in your message. So actually the robo voice is just us inserting text into the program and then it generates the voice and, and reads the text for us. So it saves us time and hopefully provides clarity, but it's, it's, it is impersonal, impersonal impersonable so um but my point is it's not that it's impersonal it's that it signals us that it's that obnoxious robocall and not that it's the town of shrewsbury somehow uh, there just needs to be a trigger for us to hear that it's a shrewsbury call before we hear that voice so one of the things that we did do over the course of the last year is we updated the caller id uh, to be the main number for the town hall. So, it, you know, it's it, it shows up or should show up. I know it shows up on, on my phone um, as, you know, 508-841-8300. So if we can ask, for, you know, one of the things I could recommend to everyone is, you know, if you're receiving those calls on your cell phone, you can update that caller ID you know, to say town of Shrewsbury. So you'll see it instead of it saying unknown caller or something like that. Um, yeah, so that's- We'll try that. Recommendation. Yeah. Okay, that's an idea. And um, how do you think the no left turn into the westbound lane of Route 20 will um, be accepted by the travelers in that area? So the overwhelming- response that the board of selectmen has received in their request for public input is people support it and want to see us do that um, we are very cognizant um, of some local road impact um, you know appaloosa and green and uh, those roads over there that would re receive some extra traffic but we think the overwhelming public good um, is for us to prohibit left turns. Um, and, you know, it, it will be an inconvenience, but unfortunately, you know, we don't, we don't like to play the, you know, the, the government knows better than the individual because that's certainly not true. But unfortunately, if we don't restrict the left turns, people are going to make them and they'll, They'll still probably make them even if we put up the no left turn signs, but we need to do everything we can to protect everyone. And it, it's, it, it's also often for people who are just unfamiliar with the area that may find themselves at that intersection. They, it needs to be really clear to them that it's very, 
not that the sign is going to say it's dangerous, but you know, if you're unfamiliar with the area and you're paying attention to the signing signage, you know, you're, you're probably not going to make it. We want to prevent the, you know, any tragedies from happening. We've had bad accidents. Uh, we don't want to see anything worse than that. So it's been overwhelmingly supported and, um, we'll be working with the Department of Transportation, you know, when the physical restriction signs go up to provide other electronic message board signs in the area to let folks know that. We've also been working very diligently over the last 60 days with Representative Kane, uh, Central Mass Regional Public or Central Mass uh, Regional Planning Commission, CMRPC, and Congressman McGovern's office. And we submitted a federal surface transport request to the Surface Transportation Board through Congressman McGovern's office um, for $14.5 million in funding to make improvements from South Street to the Northboro line. So um, certainly a lot of consideration still at the federal government on whether that gets funded or not, but um, we're doing everything we can to in make improvements based upon the master plan uh, that's been developed for the corridor. And while we're in that corner of town, um, the Allen property, uh, there's a developer. Is, has, has that land purchase gone through? Uh, we haven't closed on the property yet, uh, but the uh, developer is going through the planning process and the permitting process. And once uh, they get uh, through that, then we would look to close. And I'm hoping to do that sometime this summer. Um, they originally started off with, um, as we talked about in the past, one single uh, end user for the site. Um, and they've since, you know, kind of moved on to, I think, a more comprehensive development of that site that would be multiple buildings. And um, I think it'll be much uh, more suitable for the site and much more favorable to the town. So, um, be a little more delayed than we anticipated, but still really good news. We're still um, locked in. And actually with that little bit longer timeline, um, more of the uh, funding that was put down kind of um, as a deposit has become non-refundable. So, um, you know, the town is guaranteed through the STC really to receive, you know, nearing $100,000 since the property has been locked up and off the market uh, while they go through this permitting process. So we're, we're, we're being responsible for how we manage that. While we're on uh, development, Boylston over at the FedEx property is putting in a very large facility, which will bring a lot of traffic headed um, north, which is towards Shrewsbury. And according to their traffic studies, is something like 70% or more of the traffic is allegedly going to go on to 290. Mm -hmm. um, do you believe that that's really accurate? Well, um, interestingly enough, um, we the same developer who was considering or who we're working with at Centec North is the is the is the developer that is building that project. So we're very familiar with them. That gives us a high level of confidence in the traffic engineers that they're using and their knowledge of their end user. So yes, um, we've had a lot of offline conversations with that group. Uh, they haven't identified an end user yet uh, publicly. We're not aware of who it's going to be, but. Um, it's a quality company that we have a you know separate relationship with, so to speak, because of their interest in Centec North. So I think they're being open and honest with us and, and sharing all the information that they have for that project. And we've had the Weston and Sampson company um, doing sewer investigations with a subcontractor, and that's complete. Do you have any information there for us? Yeah, so this is part of our routine maintenance that we've been trying to uh, improve uh, in the water and sewer uh, lines of business utilities for us. Um, so they've been doing uh, inflow and infiltration investigations throughout the town to make sure, you know, 
that the only while we're trying to basically eliminate groundwater from getting into our uh, wastewater system, because every gallon of water that gets in there, even if it shouldn't be in there, you know, is a cost to treat and improve and go through the Westboro treatment plant. So that's the entire purpose behind that. Um, and um, just, you know, really good preventative maintenance, which again, we're, we're really focused on for water and sewer. I'm going to jump for a minute. Um, I've noticed a lot of new young leadership uh, working for the town and through retirements and so forth, they, they've come up. Um, and a, the sign of a good leader is someone who develops new leaders. And you seem to be doing that. Um, I'm not trying to pat you on the back or anything, but you seem to be doing that. You seem to be developing um, new young leaders. Do you have any comments on that? I guess my first comment is I love local government. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we, again, so I'm fortunate to still stand on the shoulders of, you know, all the dedicated professional local government officials that have come before, you know, me directly in this position, Mr. Morgado, Mr. Carney, um, you know, those two specifically, but just everyone else that's, that's worked for the town for, you know, whatever amount of time, but mostly really long amount of time to create what we talked about before, a really desirable, highly regarded local government. And that brings us really, um, quality candidates, more than quality candidates, excellent candidates who are interested in local government to start with. And we just fuel their passion, right? So we give them opportunities. We don't try to restrict them. If you have an idea, bring it to us. If you want to take on a, a task because you have some extra time after doing your core work, you know, let's work on it. Let's think about it. Let's go to it. And, you know, if you read kind of the general management materials and what's most important in the workplace is people want to know what their clear expectations are, responsibilities are, and how they contribute to the organization. We just simply do that. We, we happen to have a really exciting mission in serving people, um, and that attracts really good people. So, I mean, that's really it. It's just helping people do what they want to do. There's no secret to it. We support them and provide them educational opportunities and those are the things that lie behind um, these conversations about the override, right? So um, it's hard, you know, it's hard to convey to the public uh, how important it is to have the right staff, especially, you know, there's, you know, government in, in the United States, you know, isn't always thought of favorably, right? It's like, oh, I guess, you know, it's where my taxes go. They force me to pay taxes, you know. You know, I see the opposite side of that, where we get to provide really good services, improve people's quality of life, uh, help them, keep them safe. You know, that's what we're focused on. And when you find the right people who are committed to do that, it's easy to keep them. Um, so just fortunate. And Sharon Tom Thomas, our new town clerk, has made it through her first election. And <laughs> she seems to be coming out without any bruises. So. Yeah. And before you know it, town meeting will be here and she'll be at it again. Um, so, and that's another example of someone who was very confident and qualified um, to move up the chain. And yeah, move right. into congratulations leadership. to Sharon and her staff. They did a, a great job. From my perspective, you know, this is, you know, a compliment you know, no, no difference. You know, we went from a long tenured clerk to one with just a few months in the seat, so to speak, barely a few months in the seat. Um, and it went off seamlessly, no major hiccups. So no road bumps. We did a really good job and we're very appreciative. And um, I guess we can move on to uh, the stabilization fund. Do you have defined uses for that, or is it more broad than um, specific? So there was the Municipal Modernization Act that was passed um, a few years ago, 
And it actually provided us with an opportunity to think about stabilization funds differently. So we now have a couple and, and we will look to add another one for the override uh, at town meeting. But we have a general stabilization fund and that's kind of like the town's core reserves that can be spent on anything uh, if we need to spend those funds on that we could put in the general operating budget. So it can, uh, and actually other reasons, capital improvements as well. So it's really broad in the use, any general municipal purpose. And then we've established some stabilization funds for like the water enterprise fund. So it only those, if you establish a special purpose, it can only be spent on the purpose which town meeting votes to establish that account. So the water, for example, can only be spent on water expenditures. So um, we will be requesting a, a new one uh, for override stabilization and its sole purpose will be to um, hold revenue uh, till future years so we can extend the duration of the override that was approved yesterday. Interesting. Let's go on to COVID. The exciting news is hmm. for the last several days, we've had zero, two, two, um, but we are up to still a devastating 2,935 cases and 66 deaths. Um, we have had no deaths since um, you reported on April 13th. That's so correct. That's, that's hopeful yep. and promising. Yep. And what would you like to comment on related to vaccinations? Um, yeah, so everyone, every, everything is, is um, you know, I'm very pleased with, with the percentage of Shrewsbury residents who've gotten their, um, their, their vaccines so far or vaccinations so far. So we see that data. Um, we know that, you know, over, uh, you, know, you know, we're pushing 50% of the eligible population that uh, has received at least one dose and over 30% who are determined to be fully vaccinated because um, you know, they've either received the single shot of the Johnson Johnson or, or both shots of, of the other two. So um, we certainly still have a long way to go um, and we want to get as many folks vaccinated as possible. And we have too seen a reduction in, you know, folks that are reaching out to us that need assistance, which is good and bad. I mean, see a lot of appointments that are available out there and we just want to continue to encourage folks to to get it. Um, we're not out of the woods. We certainly see other countries that are still being devastated and new variants that seem to be popping up um, on a monthly basis or so. And we just want to put ourselves in the best position. You know, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts as a whole is, I, I think I heard, you know, sixth, um, I, I heard two different numbers, third in the country and sixth in the country, depending on how you look at the statistics of one, uh, shot versus two shots. So um, we want to continue that and and help residents get the get the shot, whatever they're eligible. Uh, one message I have is that when people get their first shot, their first vaccine, uh, that doesn't mean that they're free to go about and um, be a little bit more free with their masking, et cetera, uh, because. Um, I know someone who does not live in town who, through work, um, as the only outside contact, had received his first vaccine, and in less than a week, he was positive for COVID. So, um, and he's doing well, but my point is, just because you've received your first vaccination doesn't make you in the clear. So, right. people need to still be vigilant. Um Okay, let's move to town meeting. The quorum is down to 100. Yeah. And it's going to be held at the high school again. That was a good setup. I have to admit, I was uncomfortable being in a room with that many people because it's something I haven't done. But it was a very good setup. And it was well run. Do you think it'll be as streamlined this time? Can we be hopeful that it'll be as streamlined as what good as it was even um, last spring as when we were outside on Oak Street? So, 
Yes, because we plan to do everything, you know, pretty much the same way as we did it in the past, except for removing it indoors uh, from outdoors. So uh, those things include obviously six foot on center social distancing for all the chairs or desks as we have them set up at the field house. It includes um, uh, pre recording uh, information on each and every Warren article, which we're going to tape tomorrow afternoon uh, with the help of Mark at SMC. Um, it includes um, using consent agenda and bundling of articles so we can talk about like articles all together and take less fewer votes. Um, we had some audio qualities or audio areas for audio improvements that, that we can um, make within the field house to try to make folks be able to hear better and engage better in the meeting. So we're doing that. So um, I, I think we're following what was a successful model last summer. And then um, we're also trying to make some improvements to, to help it along. So I will be meeting with the new moderator, Jim Kane. Um, he reached out and expressed interest, you know, for us to get together, just like, it, you know, I used to with Mr. Mena. Uh, we'll also be holding a pre-town meeting the Thursday before town meeting, um, Thursday evening to um, answer questions, get folks comfortable, you know, all those things that we do at pre-town meeting. So, and I do believe that your pre-recorded messages were extremely valuable. Um, I found them very informative, and that was great because you could fast forward through anything you didn't feel like listening to because you've heard it so many times. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I found that to uh, be a big contributor to the efficiency of how the meeting was run. And um, I do believe Jim, our new moderator, uh, will have a big task before him because the first town meeting for any new moderator seems to be um, a bit intimidating for them. So um, he probably won't sleep the night before like the first day of school. <laughs> um, but I'm sure he'll do a good job. Now, would you like to boast about your AAA bond rating? Of course, yeah, we always like to do that. Um, yeah, so we we had the AAA bond rating affirmed again. Um, and as I mentioned a little bit earlier, the reason we went back and asked for a new rating is because um, we needed to access the market to refund uh, or refinance is uh, a more common term. Uh, the bonds that we issued in 2011 for the Sherwood School. So we're halfway through that repayment term, 20 years. So um, already, yeah, we we received a uh, AAA bond rating again because of our strong financial position and our ability to manage the the challenges of the pandemic. That was noted again. So we're very happy about that. Um, we shared with um, tr uh, Standard Poor's the challenges that we had, our approach to it, that we're asking an override question, um, where we stood with the pension and things like that. So they're very understanding of our position and still, you know, not and still, but did affirm our AAA. And I mean, it's just unbelievable the results that we got when we refinanced those bonds, three quarters of a percent, not one and three quarters, but three quarters, 0.75% is our interest rate that we got. And the, the base interest or the original interest rate on the Sherwood bonds when they were issued in 2011 was 4.185. So we went from 4.1 to three quarters of a percent. Uh, we didn't change the duration of the repayment period. Uh, so it means we're still only going to be paying them for another 10 years, but the interest change will be about $2 million. So there's $2 million. The taxpayers won't have to endure or pay for uh, simply because we exercise our right to refinance it just like remortgage in your you know refinancing your home that, that that's what we did there on the news we hear a lot about building costs rising we were always excited when um the economy was in a slump the good news was our building costs were low um, now the building costs are uh, rising. How will that impact uh, our future construction with the new police station? There'll be some impact. We're, we're, we're likely to see some impact. Our latest um, 
as you know, Donna, now on that building committee, congratulations for that as yeah. well. Good, good um, luck to them having to listen to me, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we we did a recent uh, updated um, professional cost estimate, and we're still uh, within the budget means that, that we requested. So that's good. A little less margin than, you know, we certainly had with Beal. Um, or actually at least ended up with Beal, but we'll continue to manage the project. I know you'll keep your eye on those funds as well. Um, I'm not saying that we won't have any impact because we definitely will, but you know, a lot of the costs in the general construction market, the housing market right now is lumber. Um, and that's not a major component of a police station or, or a commercial building structure because of just the size, the structure, how you build it. You know, you build a house mainly with lumber. Uh, this building will largely be constructed out of steel and, and brick and masonry and, and concrete. So um, the the real, my understanding at least, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but the real cost driver uh, in the construction industry is the fact that lumber has increased by about 400% over the last 12 months. It's cost, you know, two by four is like nine bucks. Uh, if you go to a home improvement store and want to buy one. So that's only a very small component of a project like a police station though. And um, having participated in my first meeting of the police station, I have to say uh, it seems to be uh, coming along nicely. There will be a lot of questions from everyone, I'm sure. Um, but it seems to be well organized and um, a lot of needed needed rooms will be going into this building. I've asked a few, as I randomly see police officers on the street, I'll ask them what they think of the new building pr project. And I get positive feedback. They seem very happy to know that that's coming forward for them. Um, they've lived with such <laughs> awful conditions over many years now that um, it's a very exciting time for them. And it's like like with um, Town Hall this morning when you talk about the override, um, it really plays into um, morale. And um, I hear nothing but positive from them. And I, I'm sure that the town residents will be very pleased with the project once it's done. Um, and it will bring us forward, hopefully more than the next 50 years, yes. like the station that we have. Um, I think there's a lot of forward thinking happening and the architect seems to be um, what I consider intent on listening to what the committee has for ideas and suggestions. So uh, I think it's a good project. Um, moving forward, uh, Chief Jim Bona from the fire department brought forward his report and statistics um, to the selectmen recently um, through, I think, a letter. I don't know that he presented. Um, do you have any comments on how things have gone with the fire station and the fire department in um, the past year? Yeah, so I mean, I think um, over the calendar year 2020, call volume of both police and fire were slightly down. Um, we, we benefited um, from that period of, well, I say benefited, I don't know if that's true or not, but there was that, you know, period, you know, especially last spring when pretty much everyone was at home. So less motor vehicle accidents, less calls, less, less partying, less you know, domestic type issues. Um, but, you know, we're, we're, you know, still very significant call volume, you know, over, you know, uh, 30,000. I mean, it, it, you know, for each department, it's, you know, very, you know, very big, big numbers. Um, you know, the fire department continues to, you know, meet the demands of the, of the community. Um, we, you know, brought the lieutenants on and the four new firefighters so were operating in a much safer and more reliable way. Um, didn't have very many major incidents in the community as far as structure fires, although we did have a few. So, um, continued job well done by Chief Ona and Deputy Chief Coldy and their entire leadership team. Good. Um, and 
now town the town municipal departments tend to be getting into apps you have an app for is it an app for reporting when you see things with um like the highway or around yep. town and you now have a police app where it's see it say it send it um yep. i can't keep up with it um yep. so it'll be interesting I, uh, clearly people like having those and it makes things easy for easy reporting and uh yep. communicating uh, yeah yeah and i mean hopefully at some point in the future I don't know whether we'll be able to roll all these things into a single app, but that that is something that we would like to do. You know, have a Tom Shrewsbury app that at least you can access these other means of communications right through that. So you don't have to have 50 things on your screen or your phone just related to the Tom Shrewsbury. But, you know, we're just trying to be where everyone else is, you know, um, <clears throat> unfortunately, especially for my kids, that's on their phone. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now, Keith Baldinger came in to report on the trees at Patton School, and it seems that he assessed 36 trees and 14 need pruning, which is no big deal, but nine need removal, and six of them are in front of the school. And yep. it's that, that's a safety issue that needs is. to be addressed. And um, he has a replacement plan um, for probably planting in September. Right. Um, I was surprised to see the students playing in the front of Patton School. And I don't know what they were doing there, but it's such a busy road. I don't know why they're not playing in the back, you know, away from the traffic. Yeah. And now with the trees there, I would think that um, that should change. Or yeah, there should not, be some I'm sort of sure a protection, yeah. a barrier. Um, I, I, it just made me uncomfortable you know, thinking of their safety, but uh, I can so, only guess it's probably COVID related if I had to oh, pick that's one possible. thing. That's Spreading probably out, true. you know. Yeah, that's probably it because yeah. they don't have a lot of space in the back. Right. Um, so that's probably my answer. Um, when will those trees be cut down? Uh, actually, uh, most of that work has already been done uh, while the kids were out on school vacation. So, oh, wow. Um, yep, it looks a little different down there. Well, I'll have to drive by. Um, I must have my eyes on the road so I don't see it because it's that's okay. like in that area a lot. <laughs> Lucky for everybody that my eyes are on the road. Um, Kristen and Alex, um, and Alex is your new administrative assistant. Yeah, so, um, when, yeah. Yep. so Alex has actually been with us for almost two years now. And oh, my yep, word. So uh, she's actually moving into the management analyst role that David Snowden was once in. So, yep. She's already been there two years. In June, yeah. Time yep. flies. It does. So they attended a National League of Cities meeting. Some was that remote or whatever. Um, yep. And the American Rescue Plan and the stimulus money was discussed. What does mm -hmm. that mean for Shrewsbury and how can we spend it? Yeah, so we still don't have the finest level of detail to give me the most comfort, but I think we're supposed to receive that on Monday. Uh, we did hear a lot, or they did hear a lot during that meeting about how to ensure that we can receive the money as soon as possible. So getting our accounts set up with the federal government, uh, you have to have a special um, protocol set up when you receive a federal grant directly, which is, you know, what we're going to be, is my understanding of how we're going to receive some of this funding. Um, still remains in those four broad buckets um, that we'll be able to, to spend it on, including revenue replacement, which, you know, will hopefully um, lessen the need for raising the full amount of the override in the first year. And that's something that we're fully committed to doing. If we don't have to raise a dollar or whatever the total number is, we certainly won't do that. That's that's our commitment always. Um, yeah, so they, they did learn a lot about the precursors to receiving the grant funding. And um, it's my understanding that the US Treasury will be issuing that probably you know, 30 or 50 pages of direct guidance on how to make calculations and, you know, it can be spent on this, it can't be spent on that on Monday, May 10th, and that the funds are supposed to be transferred um, at least to the states on that same day. And there are a lot of restrictions are in place. Yep. Do you want to talk about that at all? 
Yeah, so um, it's just the traditional uh, annual summer water restrictions on, on easing the amount of water that we use uh, and put through the water system for conservation purposes um, for the benefit of the long term capacity of our wells. So that went into place. You know, we continue, you know, also in the water department to do our unidirectional flushing and valve replacement. And we're actually making significant progress as we thought we would. Um, when we've gotten through the areas of a town where we've had the most water quality challenges, uh, we've moved beyond that. Um, we're receiving a lot less water, poor water quality calls, which means our unidirectional flushing is working. It's something that we're just going to have to keep doing and managing the system. And um, do you have a sidewalk plan that's really going to happen? Um, so we don't not to implement at this point, no, but we uh, plan to start our design work with it. Uh, we're putting 150000 or $125,000 in place at the town meeting. Um, and we do start to, uh, we do plan to start uh, designing for sidewalks in some of those high pedestrian areas um, and begin implementing those plans to the, the extent that, that we can. So I'm really excited that we're actually gonna take that first step um, sidewalks are interesting. They may seem simple. You just throw them along the roadway, but sometimes our, the, the width of the pavement is all that the town owns at this point within the right of way. So we have to work with those folks who have property and acquire easements and be able to put the sidewalks in. I will say, since we're talking about sidewalks, if you drive past the new Beale school on Lake street, you will see that the base has been cut in for sidewalks from the new school the whole way down to high Alier. Um, so uh, a lot of work in that area. The road has been milled. So the sidewalk will start to be installed and final paving will occur uh, on the roadway uh, in the next few months, including the sidewalk. So it will really transform that area past the Shrewsbury Youth Soccer Fields, which has been our partner in, in this whole project and use of land and everything up there. So it's exciting to see. Is it possible that that will extend down to at least SAC, if not further at some point over time? Uh, that would, that's, that would be the desire. Yes. Once we get beyond high the, the, as I said before, the width of the roadway gets much more narrow and we've got a, a lot more mature trees that would be impacted. So uh, that will take a little bit more study, but that'd be a great connection uh, for that neighborhood. I notice pedestrians pretty regularly yeah. jumping up onto people's lawns when cars are coming by because it's so narrow. Yeah. Um, in the other place, Dr. Harding talks about Prospect Street and uh, the need for sidewalks on Prospect Street. I want to say that discussion has been going on for well over 30 years. Mm -hmm. And um, the other place would be Old Mill Road and Harrington Ave. Um, when you think of those heavily traveled roads and where yep. people who want to get out and walk really have to take a risk when they um, get to the road where there's no sidewalk with such heavy traffic. So I realize that's one of the first things that gets cut all the time with budgets, but um, yep. it's, it's at least something that we still need to look at. Um, yeah, and we'll at least take a baby step on prospect as we execute the cemetery master plan that will include sidewalks for that entire strip of town land and then we can build from there. Um, I watched the cemetery master plan and um, first of all, I, I really think that concerts in a cemetery would probably be a bit crazy and I say that because if you watch um people in the cemetery when they're there for a large gathering they they forget that they're walking over grave sites and so i'd be concerned about um how you bring people into a cemetery um for large gatherings i think that's mm -hmm. something to keep in mind the other thing they showed flat flat stones i mean it looks beautiful when they the master plan when they show the other cemeteries, it does look beautiful, but the flat stones, if you notice in a lot of cemeteries, not just in Shrewsbury, um, the flat stones tend to sink. And in a lot of places, 
Um, they're not well maintained. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to keep it a sacred place, um, I wouldn't be a big promoter of um, too many flat stones. And the other thing I noticed, they talked about saving money by not paving the access road. I think that's short sighted. I think, yeah. I think um, they, I can't imagine the cemetery people trying to get in through muddy roads and terrain. Right. And so I think something like that is short sighted. Um, we really only have five minutes left and I haven't even gotten to um, any of the town meeting articles, but um, chapter 90 highway funds um, with local transporto transportation aid, we're doing well? Yeah, so uh, we'll receive uh, we received a letter from the Baker Polito administration where we'll get almost a million, like $986,000 again this year. So that's very helpful. That's our funding for our annual roadway improvement plan. So um, that, that's continued great news uh, for that. Um, and there's a, an article for town meeting about term limits by petition that's brought to town meeting. Um, We've seen what term limits, limits does to other boards in town. Um, I can't imagine why someone would want to put term limits in place for um, elected positions. Um, that should be quite controversial. Do you have any comments on that? No, I mean, I think, you know, from my position, it's it's a little, a little hard to comment on it, but I, 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 I you know, we have three year terms, right? So that means everyone's subject to reelection every three years. Um, I, you know, I think this year was very interesting that we had one seat that was identified that would be vacant, you know, way back in January and we had one candidate, you know, and that has seemed to have been, you know, the norm more than contested races. So uh, if we were having, you know, a situation where the incumbent was always winning because that provided them with some type of advantage, then I guess the term limits would be the case. But, you know, I would be concerned that just the opposite, that, you know, we may have a situation where someone was forced to leave office that didn't want to leave office and we didn't have anyone running. I mean, that has happened or, in towns. <laughs> or, you didn't, or you didn't have a qualified candidate. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's something to be said for... Um, fresh ideas, but there's something to be said for uh, people having a genuine understanding of what's happening in the town and, and right. as it evolves. So I look at it myself as it's a three year term. If you don't like the person, vote them out. You don't have to keep them there. You can vote them out. So yeah. um, anyways, it'll be interesting to see where that discussion goes at town meeting. You also have a new assistant town planner. Yes. Row, Row, Rowan, 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 Rowan McC yeah, McAllister. Rowan, yeah, Rowan McAllister. Yep. So she's uh, finishing up her uh, master's degree in planning and is working part time and transitioning full time to us. Um, you know, another great asset to the organization. There's a nice write up about her in the community advocate. Um, so very helpful, happy to have her on board and uh, working, uh, planning department is something that, you know, we talked about during the override process, something that we need to think about and build upon, um, you know, with the exception of human resources and that function, it's, uh, our youngest department within the organization it started really in as part of engineering in 2010, when Kristen Lass, you know, became the town's first planner. Um, that's really um, hard to think about with all the growth that went on in, in town where we just really managed it from a engineering aspect and not really a, a planning. I think that the community faces challenges with affordable housing, town center development, economic development, and those functions all lie within the planning department. And we really need to put some resources into that over the coming years to make sure that, that we are, um, supporting the tax rate, supporting individual residents, supporting affordable housing and things like that. That's where that all lies within the planning department. 
Well, we're out of time. Um, I still have many questions, but thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.